All right. I'm not sure if you have seen Netflix's quarterback with uh, the features, you know, the behind the scenes look at last season with Kirk Cousins, Marcus Mariota and Patrick Mahomes. Definitely interesting. But then also news broke on the same day that quarterback uh, opened up and that was HBO announcing hard knocks. Uh, that may or may not have been a coincidence uh, at the same time, but the New York Jets will be the feature there with Aaron Rodgers. So wanted to get your thoughts on both of those, considering we haven't gotten to see Aaron Rodgers featured in a behind the scenes look like this before. And then on top of it, uh, we haven't had a uh, a series, a documentary series quite like quarterback either. So uh, kind of an interesting approach to um, both of those looks at behind the scenes of the NFL. I have not watched quarterback yet because I have been so busy with the music man and quiz community theater there every night we open on uh, this upcoming Thursday. So I, I have not Hill. literally had any time to watch it. Uh, I was going to try to watch it this weekend, uh, but my wife was watching something on Netflix. My uh, stepdaughter was watching something on Netflix in the other room. And so I opened up my laptop to watch it on my laptop on Netflix, at least get an episode in the other night. And it was like, there are too many people signing on your account. On, yeah, on different yeah you're the odd man out in that situation. And you have to upgrade. I was like, well, I guess I'm not watching it tonight either. So I just go to YouTube and uh, catch up on some old part of my take. Uh, but a, the, uh, so no, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm beyond excited to watch it. And I'm, I'm even more excited to watch the, uh, hard knocks, of the New York jets, obviously Aaron Rodgers will be the storyline, but Dan, think about how many other storylines they have. I think the bigger thing is the jets. What did they do? As soon as it got announced that they were the hard knocks the next day, they were like, all right, Quinn Williams signed three year deal, yeah, exactly. lock him up yeah. because Holdouts are a bad thing on hard knocks. It's a bad look. No one likes the holdout st- the ho- holdout argument. But do you think about it? C.J. Mosley, Quentin Williams, Sauce Gardner, they have stars at each level of their defense, like entertaining guys, star, big personality guys. And then you obviously have the young wide receiver, Garrett Wilson, me- meshing with the Lazars and the Cobbs who know Aaron. So that's going to be a fun storyline. And then, of yeah, course, Brees Hall Zach- coming off an of injury. Yeah, Zach Wilson. Like that is yeah. a huge storyline for for Hard Knocks in and of itself as well. Um, I, I I can't wait. I I I'm beyond excited to get the clips out of that. I there's gonna be so many Aaron Rodgers gifts from this from that show. Oh yeah, it's gonna be monumental. I'm hopeful that this is a somewhat resurgence for the series because, to be quite honest, I've been a little underwhelmed with it in recent years. And I think part of that is because it's kind of become commercialized. And by that, I mean, with the NFL itself, it it doesn't push buttons anymore because HBO wants to keep that access and continue its ability. But I remember early on, man, we got some inside info and looks that weren't always favorable to the teams or a particular player. Right. And while that's still the case to some extent, they they're quick to like, we'll turn the cameras off if you want us to turn the cameras off and we'll, you know, make sure that we're not getting too uh, granular with some of the details on these things. And those are the parts that I, as a fan really enjoyed of the series. Now it seems like more the NFL is calling the shots and the team calls the shots uh, as to what's allowed. But Hey, if it comes, if it's that or no hard knocks, then I'll take this yeah. you know version of it. Um, and that being said, this is the first one I, I you know, may, I could be wrong, but the first one in recent memory where it's a very high profile city, like a big New York, you know, bright lights type of team spotlight. So I'm very intrigued to see what that looks like. And I will say about quarterback, it's much different than hard knocks. So you kind of appreciate that uh, at the same time. It's it's kind of slow, you know, they really, I mean, cause we're just focusing on three guys really this whole time. So, you know, sometimes you're, you're just talking about their, you know, photo shoots or stuff like that, that maybe you don't like care so much about, but it's definitely, it definitely gives you a greater appreciation. I would say for Kirk cousins, to be honest, you ah. kind of realize like this guy gets hit a lot. I saw like a stat coming out that he has been top three in quarterback hits in the last six years. So the guy has taken his fair share of shots. Well, he's and, not uh, mobile. T- he's not mobile, but to his credit, he's out there. He plays the game and he's, uh, he's available for his team. So that, much you know, I Dan, I, I, I'll just say one thing about hard knocks for me is I think part of what was so exciting when it first started too, was that 
We just, it was so new. We never yeah, saw we had never anything seen that like before. it before. Well, now we get so much from just the social media accounts of like training camp and access in that way. And we have tweets of, of this and in the locker room. And um, so we we're get we're more comfortable with that access now. So it's less just awesome to see from hard knocks. The other thing I think hard knocks has its own formula, which is I think becoming more detrimental. It's like, all right, introduce me to the guy who's barely going to make the cut and the guy who's barely going to miss the cut. And this undrafted rookie, like I, I'd be more, I'd be more excited for hard knocks to really flip it a little more in its head this year. I'm like, Oh no, no we're, we're going to give you just unprecedented all Aaron Rodgers access as much as possible. And that's what we're going to focus on. Every piece of footage that they let us take of Aaron Rodgers, We're going to show that we're going to give that to you. When's the last time we had a big time star star quarterback on hard knocks? I I don't Yeah, remember. I mean cuz usually it's you've missed the playoffs two years in a row. Those were always the requirements. And to miss the playoffs two years in a row, most of the time you don't have a good quarterback. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean that's uh, that's a good point. And and some of the teams that do have great quarterbacks uh you know really push back on it. And it does seem like the Jets kind of didn't want to do this either. And like yeah. Aaron Rodgers has already come out oh, and they like, definitely didn't we were forced uh into this. But nonetheless, I mean, you know, sometimes you, you just got to got to go with it. And who would uh, make be your three guys you'd want to see on quarterback next year? On quarterback next year. Yes. Yeah, so that's interesting, too. I, if we're going to follow somewhat of a formula of an average guy, a superstar and a, uh, you know, either young and inexperienced and not proven or just, you know, one of the journeyman guys, I would say for that formula, me personally would want. Uh, the star to be either Josh Allen or Joe Burrow. I would love to see either one of those. And then Kenny Pickett, of course, selfishly uh, as like the uh, the average guy. And then for like the other one where it's like either young and totally unproven or a journeyman, I, I, I'd be interested in a variety of guys. Like Derek Carr would be interesting to me to see how wh what his life is like or like even – uh, you know, maybe a Jimmy G, the ups and downs of his career. Uh, and then if it was a young guy, you know, maybe I would throw in a uh, Anthony Richardson just because he's super polarizing and uh, probably won't have a superstar year where we know that he's a, you know, a top five quarterback. So those would be the yeah. three for me. What about you? I think about, I think about like the filming this year, cause they'd be filming this year. So like, what, I, right. what do I want to yeah. see? Like, what do I, my expectations I'm, to me, again, selfishly, but I also think it's a big expectation year in a big market. Like I think Justin Fields would be fascinating to be on That'd that. That'd be list. great. I I think expectation wise, plus like celebritas, I would go Josh Allen. He's now dating like Haley Steinfeld. Just broke up with his longtime girlfriend. Uh, there's a lot of expectations. Buffalo such a unique market. What his life is like on a day to day basis in Buffalo, I think would just be really kind of fascinating to see. Um, and I'd be very interested to see what the life of Bryce Young or CJ Stroud or Anthony Richardson, like one of the top three rookies. Yeah. A rookie quarterback would this be year Because we think all of them are going to play and play a significant amount. Mm -hmm. And I do think that would be really fun or interesting to see the other name I would throw out there, which I think would be cool if Netflix was already filming them and following them would be someone in the San Francisco 49ers locker room, whether it be Purdy, Trey Lance or Sam Darnold, because I think that quarterback room right now is a fascinating room. They should just, just do a series on that. Just those yeah, three guys. And just knowing like, like what is one of those guys, you know what I mean? Like, if they're already filming with Purdy is like, is he getting healthy? Is he actually going to start the season? Or if it is Sam Darnold and Sam Darnold, look at the start of the Niners season. Sam Darnold could go three and oh, four and oh, like, and if, and if that happens, do you sure. bench Sam Darnold if he's playing well? You know what I mean? Like uh, it's a very, uh, or if you're Trey Lance, like how is this guy fighting for his career? Um, that those are interesting storylines to me too, of just from kind of an other another standpoint of of the series for sure kyler 100%. murray would also be funny just see how much video games he actually plays <laughs> yeah there, there you lot. go you get some insight there
Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, yeah, I guess Will Levis, the other rookie quarterback, could be interesting because he will have a big time weapon to throw to, which is the topic of conversation for today's show. Yes. Uh, also, obviously, we are recording now at two thirty p.m. Eastern time, which means we have an hour and a half left of this franchise tag deadline, and it's not looking too good for any of the three quarterbacks or running backs, I should say. Yeah. Still waiting to get a long term extension done. So that is the primary topic for today's discussion. Let's get to it. Join Sam Odiemi as he breaks down everything from the NBA during points in the paint, from breaking down deals and assessing free agent signings to recapping all the excitement from the association with the best analysis out there. Points in the Paint, live on the For Frequency Sake Podcast Network. All right, that was one of our other shows here on the For Frequency Sake Podcast Network, which brings you this show, The Football Lounge with Mark and Dan. We're excited to be a part of it. Lots of good shows and got some fantasy football shows getting ready to ramp up as well with just a month left before the NFL season. So if you're looking to get uh, some news on your fantasy football drafts, definitely check it out for fantasy sake. Uh, QC there. Mark, we've got some news today. Uh, we've got some news over the weekend. So let's dive into the biggest one being DeAndre Hopkins finally having himself a new home. And that is in Nashville, the Tennessee <laughs> Titans uh, coming to terms with DeAndre Hopkins on a two year, $26 million deal at the face of it. Obviously it doesn't seem like it's a groundbreaking contract and it's not that being said, $3 million of incentives are up for grabs each of these two years based on uh, yards, catches, touchdowns. Uh, so if he gets 95 catches, uh, 10, uh, 1050 yards, and 10 touchdowns, that would get him his full incentives for the year. But nonetheless, a lot of questions about why would DeAndre Hopkins choose to go to Tennessee? A lot of people wanted him to go to New England or at least thought that Bill Belichick was going to make the move. And I will say, as I toss it to you here, everyone is somehow blaming Bill Belichick for this as if there wasn't another party involved in these contract discussions. DeAndre Hopkins could have just not wanted to go to New England, which, to be fair, why would he? I mean, there's, uh, you know, a tumultuous, uh, you know, relationship there, it seems, between the quarterback Mac Jones and Bill Belichick. Uh, now, obviously, Bill O'Brien is there. There would have been a, a, a reuniting, so to speak, of that, and he should make the offense better. But uh, the, the Patriots' offense is just in shambles. And then you look here to the Tennessee Titans, and you say, why would he go to Tennessee? That offense doesn't look very good. Well, my explanation for this, and I'd be curious to see what your thoughts, and to me, it's pretty simple. It's target share. He is guaranteed a hefty target share in this offense. He will be the guy. and let's be honest, like in terms of reaching incentives, probably one of the easier pathways for him to reaching those incentives and all of that while getting to maintain uh, a, a good contract that he wanted and a still a chance at making the playoffs and competing. I mean, the Tennessee Titans aren't just uh, an atrocious team. I mean, this is a group that has been in playoff contention the last several years with Mike Vrabel there and Ryan Tannehill's uh, not necessarily a scrub a quarterback. I don't think so. To me, it it all things kind of pointed to if DeAndre Hopkins wanted a good mix of getting the money while also having a sizable role and being able to compete for the playoffs, this kind of checked those boxes. Yeah, I, it all depends. We don't know. If the offers were exactly the same, for instance, between New England and Tennessee, well, then it would be easier to make the storylines of a go. Oh, he maybe does not want to be with back with Bill O'Brien or Maybe it's Mac Jones, the reason he doesn't want to be there, or maybe it's it is Bill Belichick, and he he's not a fan of Bill Belichick. I, I, let's be honest; I think part of it is I think this is probably the financially the best offer for him, and and I think that matters to him. And and I, I who am I to say what what should be the most or not the most important thing for this point of his career? I also think there's familiarity with the AFC South, like he spent his peak bulk of his years with Houston in the AFC South. He's returning to the AFC South. He knows those teams. He knows those buildings. He knows that travel schedule. 
Uh, I agree with you. I think the AFC South is a more wide open division compared to the other ones. Obviously, the Jags are the favorites, but that's just funny to say. The Jaguars are the favorites in and of itself. It's still going to take some time to get used to thinking that way. And if you're a team that, um, again, if you're DeAndre Hopkins, he's trying to put the button on a Hall of Fame career. I I think he is a borderline Hall of Famer at this point. But if he can have another 2,000, you know, two 1,000 plus yard receiving years with another, say, 16 to 20 touchdowns in the next two years of his career in Tennessee, though you start add that to his numbers that he already has with another, you know, 70 plus receptions each year, holy, holy smokes. Like now we're talking about a real Hall of Fame resume for a guy who passes the eye test as a Hall of Famer, right? Because there's that Absolutely. level when you talk about a wide receiver. Like he passes the wide receiver eye test are his numbers in the modern NFL with the explosion of the game with it as well. I also think for him, you have to say to yourself, this is a dude who played his career in Houston and then Arizona. Do you really want to go play outside in New England in the AFC? And not only are you playing then all those home games in New England, You then have to play at Buffalo and at the Jets. So that's a guaranteed 10 games, you know, almost what? uh, Yeah, to to 9, 10, 11 games guaranteed in the North, like outdoors, cold weather versus Nashville, where you might get some rainy, chilly games, but you'd experience that, you know what I mean, in the AFC South uh, at its worst anyways. I think... That matters for a wide receiver. It is an aging wide receiver. All of that plays a factor. And, um, you know, I would imagine state income taxes and things like that always play a factor with money. I think it makes sense that he's in in Nashville. The fact that they were willing to go two years. If, again, if if it was only one-year deals out there, then I think there were better places for him to go football-wise, numbers-wise. But if this was a two-year deal, and it was the only two-year deal. It's a pretty solid two-year deal. It's good extra gar- sure. $24 million guaranteed uh, for you on the back end of your career. Nice chunk of change for the back end of your career. And like you said, the first thing, and I think it's really important, the target shares. Traylon Burks is a, it was a really nice rookie season, and he is a physically different receiver from, from, uh, 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 from DeAndre. And when the Titans offense was really clicking two years ago when they were the one seed they had aj brown who was a 1300 yard receiver and they had a a, a really efficient passing offense so i think it's still the possibility of being there and if you're tennessee it makes sense to say we need to be able to score points in the afc let's go get our guy another weapon and we have a now core of weapons we really like even though they're older you know what i mean with henry and Tannehill and with uh hopkins and if you have to transition to what Levis, well, already you say to go to Will Levis next year, you have a first round receiver and you have DeAndre Hopkins and Derrick Henry. Like you have enough weapons to succeed. So they'll be able to know right away if he's the guy or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a pretty clear path there. Not to mention if, you know, I mentioned that Tannehill is certainly on the back half of the quarterbacks in this league at this point in his career. Yeah. But, you know, he's not, he's not bottom five or anything like that either. And Diop has had his share of bad quarterback play over his career. So in in a way, I think that that was less of a concern maybe for him because he knows that he can put up great numbers kind of regardless of who is under center, you know? And so I think with some of that knowledge, maybe was a little bit more of a comfort for him, whether or not Tannehill starts all of the games or Will Levis comes in early on, then he can be that guy that Will Levis leans on and throws up to him more often than not as a, a, you know, uh, make a big play. And and as a receiver, you want to be in that position more often than not. So I think it's, uh, you know, a lot of things, as I said, kind of check the boxes there for DeAndre Hopkins. And from a production standpoint, obviously this makes Tennessee better. They are Mm -hmm. now in a place where they can say, well, we, we're we not just going to give this division over to Jacksonville here. We feel like, you know, Indy might be one or two years away from b- being in that contention again. And the Texans are, you know, in a re- full-on rebuild right now. So uh, they're, they're not just going to, you know, 
uh, keel over and die here. They're going to put up a fight. And now they have an ability to say, well, we actually have the best receiver in division right now uh, to, to at least put us in a, in a spot where we can you know, win some of these games and especially these division games. So I think it's a, it's a kind of a win-win for Deandre yeah. and for the Tennessee Titans. You know, here. Tennessee and, and has situation the second, all around. Tennessee is the second best coach in their division. If not the best with Vrabel and Peterson, yep. they have, um, the second best quarterback right now in their division. And you say to yourself, their defense is maybe the best defense in that division, um, especially with the coaching uh, that they get from Vrabel. My, my thing with Tennessee is they could be a sneaky, this could help them be a sneak, become a sneaky wild card team. Because if they can find a way to go 4 0 against the Colts and the Texans and then split with the Jags, that's 5 and 1. Um, their schedule is going to be workable because they weren't a playoff team in other spots. And you look at the AFC North, AFC West, AFC East. These divisions are a bloodbaths, man. I mean, they are uh, the teams that win the division. Yes, they get their playoff spot, but you've gone through a slog of just beating. Yeah, each they other. earned it for sure. <laughs> Everyone else they have to beat each other up so much. Tennessee might be able to be actually be like the 10th best team in the AFC, but get one of those top seven spots and be a playoff team because their yeah. schedule is favorable and who they're playing. I have to look at Tennessee's schedule. I might do that here really quickly. Um, but does that make sense? Like the fact that the sure. division is weaker, this move could take them from a, you know, an eight win team to a nine, maybe a 10 win team. And all of a sudden they're in the playoffs. We're going, how are they in the playoffs? Yeah, it, it could very easily swing that way for sure. And you know, they've been that team that's kind of been a tough out for a lot of teams throughout the last couple of years because they are fighters. You mentioned Vrabel kind of has instilled that culture. Yeah, they were seven and like ten what, last year. They weren't they weren't yeah, no, they weren't garbage. that bad. No, no. And it, it's it it very much uh has the tone of what Dan Campbell has done in Detroit, kind of uh, building fighters and 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 tough players, and slowly but surely bringing that stability there. It, it's okay. Been so tough I, the I gotta find position, a way. To, but... I gotta find a way to get to Tennessee to nine ish wins, yes. right? So sure. to be a borderline playoff like that seventh seed. So let's say they go five and one in division. They sweep the Colts. That is a they, tall they order. Have to do but that. Fair enough. They have to do that. They have to go five and one in division, right? You then have games, winnable games, I think, against the Saints, the Browns. Those are winnable games. Uh, you have winnable games against the Falcons. So uh, let's get the Falcons. They take the care of the Falcons at home. There are six wins. They take care of the Bucks on the road. That's seven wins. Um, they host the Panthers. That's eight wins. Um, ba, 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 ba. You know, then, so eight wins. Then they got to they gotta win a toss-up maybe against the the – Steelers or against the Saints, against the Browns, like it's workable. All of a sudden you could convince yourself it could be workable. And I hate to do this to myself now a week or two before we have to go through and pick this because now in the back of my head, I'm going to be saying to myself, are the Titans a playoff team? But maybe D Hop helps them them do that. It's a well coached team and they have a good culture. Um yeah, Derrick Henry's still there. Too, Derrick Henry's you know? still there. Um, so it's possible, which D Hop signing might actually be the you know the biggest blessing for Derrick Henry. the The guys and yeah. might not have to face eight man boxes anymore. And and, and it gives life to Derrick Henry. It gives life to a, to a yeah. team that otherwise is going in like, all right, well we didn't make big changes. Now you are not a one trick pony anymore. Yeah, you inject that and you go, all right, hey, maybe that early energy in the season of like we got D Hop, maybe they're gonna come out with a little more swag and. That's that's certainly something that can uh, catch on with a with a program, and uh, and uh, you know Vrabel's the type of guy to to rah rah that up for sure. One of the other items of note is a running back in the AFC, and in the AFC North that would be Bengals running back Joe Mixon, an interesting one here, but maybe makes sense given what we've seen from the market. We just discussed that on our episode a couple weeks ago of the declining running back market out there, not just at the franch franchise tag, but just teams uh, not willing to work extensions. The Bengals and Joe Mixon agreed to a restructured contract. So he was yeah. only 
going to be yeah, under contract for this upcoming year. And there were still some questions on whether he was going to hold out for a new extension or what was going to happen with all of that. This restructuring uh, actually has him taking a pay cut this season and then moving some money over to next year as well, in which he would be taking a pay cut over that two year period. However, there is a couple million in incentives here for Joe Mixon in this reworked contract. And on top of that, as we say, maybe a little bit more stability where the door opens up for a return to the Bengals in 2024 as well. So, you know, potentially an ability here for Joe Mixon to have some more stability in his contract for the next two years. And obviously this is great for the Bengals because they free up some money and get to have, you know, one of the better running backs in the NFL still on their team uh, while opening the door for him to stick with them a little bit longer term than maybe what was initially thought in the interim here. So seems like a big win for the Bengals and for Joe Mixon. Maybe this is helping Curry some favor with the Bengals to work out an extension going into next year. Uh, but an interesting thing nonetheless, where he is saying, I'm going to be taking a pay cut in the prime of my career, kind of zigging when all of the other running backs have been zagging as of late. So I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. And obviously we don't know all of the details to this contract. Maybe there's something in there we're missing that's way more incentivized for Joe Mixon. But at face value, it really seems like he's doing a a big time favor to the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, I think part of the, you know, Joe Mixon is, you know, he had some run-ins with the law and some Sure did. Some yeah. headlines that were maybe not didn't have as great. much leverage as we thought. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe he didn't have that. And I also think he knows too. I and it's what it's similar to what I said to Saquon Barkley. Sometimes staying in one spot and just being there, even if it means less money, it's just it will pay more dividends in the end. If he's able to help the Bengals win a Super Bowl this year. Like that alone is yet yeah, that's alone. Like that's free dinners for life in Cincinnati. That, that takes you from being, Oh, that re really great player that we liked. And he was good for us to like legendary status to where you, you, you get the endorsement deals. You get the things that, that uh, come with that, that you, you can't quantify right now in the contract. Um, Again, it's a bad look of running backs taking less money after our episode last sure. week, where we we're talking about how running backs need to need to, get as much in as possible to help those salaries increase, to help those franchise tags, to do all the things that will help running backs. But it's great news for the Bengals just as far as on the field football playing goes. He is a huge part of what makes that offense work. Um, a good run game makes even the greatest quarterbacks of all time that much better. And every single quarterback would tell you a solid run game is their absolute best friend. When play action opens on up, when a defense has to honor on a third and four that you could actually be running the ball, that is huge. I mean, it's just huge for an offensive advantage in an already offensive advantage league. Um, and Joe Mixon and keeps you a little more fresh too. Uh, Joe Mixon, when healthy, is very much a in the conversation as a top five back. Is he a top three back? No, but he's in that window of that next tier of guys to say to yourself, yeah. When healthy uh, and not uh, doing menacing, aggravating things off the field, uh, you know, you, you you love the product that's on the field. And during that Super Bowl run for him, for them, he was obviously a huge part of it. So um, staying in one spot, the continuity, not having to just have the cost of moving saves you a lot of money, uh, sure. you know, with your contract and all those type of things. And also, if he's got already endorsement deals built in in the Cincinnati market, you forget about those things when you talk about this. Like, staying put matters. I said it was Saquon, like the Subway deal. Whatever other, I'm sure, advertising local things he's got in New York. That pays your rent. That pays your bills. Like, you know what I mean? The NFL money, if you're smart, like, like guys like Gronk always were, that's the money you just put away and you don't even touch and you let just grow and you live off the interest if you're, if you're smart and you have good people managing your money. Um, so I, I think this is, this is one of those deals. We'll look back if the Bengals again are the ones that are going toe to toe with the chiefs and Joe Mixon has a great year. You say to yourself, well, that, that type of culture and however they were able to make it happen worked for them. And it's a, it was a huge, huge benefit for them.
yeah, the grass isn't always greener, right? I mean, we've we've seen that time and time again. And interestingly enough, that kind of coincided with Le'Veon Bell posting to, I think it was uh, Instagram or maybe his TikTok a couple days ago with a public apology to the Steelers fan base saying really? I should have never left. He said it was it, that was my fault. I should have never left. And he's gone on a couple shows uh, in the last month or so discussing all of that and how he thought what he was doing was something bigger for the position and what was best for him. And he realized, uh, you know, sometimes being in the system that helped you flourish and, you know, maybe taking a few less dollars in the end will work out in your favor. And so, you know, he's obviously kind of the face of that, but there have been many running backs over the years where we have seen it not work out at all after they think that they're making a big move elsewhere. One of the big things that I think we we didn't touch on last week um, that is should be stated is we we did mention I do stand by this that running back is maybe one of the easier positions to translate from the college to the NFL game. It is a very Definitely. individual yeah. position and where your skill set just is your skill set. But you think about the continuity of an offense of a play caller that knows your skill set of an offensive line. You know what I mean, like. You know the guys in front of you. If you got to change teams and you're trying to relearn, do I trust this guard to make this block on this play? Or do I know that my guy maybe struggles a little bit and he's got a tough matchup and I can always bounce this way or cut that way? It, it, no, nothing is easy in the NFL. And I think that's maybe one of the things we um, – not. I don't think we were trying to imply that being a running back is easy in the NFL, but I think people who are listening will understand that. But I think it, this is a great point to bring it up to – Staying in one spot, it, it always can be helpful to your career if it's a good spot. And he's he's been treated well in Cincinnati as far as the load, the carries, the numbers, being a part of that offense. And I think he, he is smart to say to himself, if it, this is what it takes for me to stay here and to keep getting yards and keeping a part of this thing, then I, I'm all for it. Absolutely. Uh, and then the other item of note, as we kind of transition into the franchise tags, one of the non-running backs to be franchise tagged ahead of the season was the Jaguars tight end, Evan Ingram, who has now agreed to a extension yeah. and a three-year contract worth $41.25 million. We talked in that running back episode about the ballooning of the tight end market. We may be seeing kind of a tight end renaissance. I mean, we we already have been, but we may be even seeing that trajectory of the position continuing to rise. About fourteen million a year. It's about fourteen million a year, and on top of that, he has incentives uh, that can can really push this. Uh, it's twenty four million guaranteed, by the way, for Evan Ingram in this one, and he's just coming off of a career year in 2022 73 catches 766 yards and four touchdowns so obviously Doug Peterson's system worked well for Evan Ingram who's still young who obviously didn't have the success in New York that he wanted but there was a lot of turnover there with the quarterback position yeah. and what was going to be happening so you can understand maybe why it didn't necessarily work out the guy's always been much more of a receiving tight end than a blocking one Seems to really have that chemistry with Trevor Lawrence in this uh, Peterson system. So all things are pointing to the Jaguars yet again doing smart business here where they have locked up quality veteran guys like Zay Jones, who no one was thinking about in terms of a, a guy that was going to produce for any NFL offense. He comes there, does well. They go and get Calvin Ridley, who you know, is going to be fresh off of a year and a half of not playing football. Christian Kirk, they make the deal with. They draft Travis Etienne. All of a sudden, we're looking at this offense like, holy smokes, they got weapons everywhere. And now Evan Ingram is the latest to be locked up for this core run. I think, and, and I think you agree with me here, the Jaguars are way closer to contending than maybe people are even giving them credit for. I, I feel like this year, they are already in the conversation to make a push for an AFC championship game. And dare I say it, potentially even a Super Bowl. I think they are that close to being. Well, there. they, um, I mean, listen, they were in the final four last year in the AFC. And that is, yeah. that is to be said, you know, that, that takes weight. The AFC is not a lightweight. It's just not, but it just, you'll agree. It doesn't seem like 
at least in like the the media or maybe some of the larger pundits aren't no. really talking about the Jags as being a, I, I, a Super Bowl not, contender. But but the problem yeah. is is because I think the media and is rightfully so, and and I'm I'm going to stick with this too. We've over the last two three years of the AFC tried to find the pop team. Bills, 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 Bills. Bengals, 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 Bengals. The Broncos last year, the Broncos are going to be the pop team. Broncos are going to finally take down the Chiefs. And every year it's still the Chiefs. Like the Chiefs, 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 Chiefs. So I, I think I think the media is learning a little bit in that, like, let's not disrespect the Super Bowl champs. And Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying you're going to pick them to win the Super Bowl, but they, they're they they're in contention is the point. Yeah. I mean, because you could I, say I, the Bengals and the, the Jaguars, Bills were. I think the Jaguars absolutely have the capability of being a, a Final Four AFC team again next year. Um, yeah. Once, when you, if you're, if you're in that Final Four, in the AFC with Mahomes, with Burrow, with Allen, um, then it's whoever wins, may the best man win type of thing. I mean, but that's where you got to be at. You know, you want to be in that final four, which puts the pressure on the Deshaun Watsons, on the Russell Wilsons, on the Aaron Rodgerses to get into that final four, to the the Justin Herberts. You got to get in that final four and be a part of that conversation because that's um, those are the money making moments in the AFC right now. Those are the the Hall of Fame type of moments right now in the, for the AFC and the battle they have going on. Um, Dan, for, as far as the actual move for Evan Ingram, I, I really like it for the Jaguars because, in all honesty, three years, only $24 million guaranteed. That's a pretty nice deal. Yeah. yeah. And for a guy whose career seemed to be already on the fritz. Like, yeah. This guy and, is, and, may and not be in the NFL. Jaguars, you, know. you got to remember Doug Peterson comes from the Andy Reid tree. And they value the tight end. And Doug Peterson valued the tight end when he was in Philly. And he already showed you in one year in um in in Jacksonville, Evan Ingram had a had big numbers and, and you know for a tight end. You know what I mean? It's hard because Kelsey's numbers make all tight ends like that. Well, looks yeah, pathetic. They, it's it's Kelsey, but all the others, yeah. What what Ingram had last year historically is considered a very great year for a tight end. You know what I mean? Receiving absolutely. Lines. Yeah. Um so again, I think I think the Titan, the Jaguars need to find their other tight end. They, they need to find the Brent Selleck version now, the blocker mm -hmm. who's going to come in and, and help protect, because they have the split out wide, the weapon tight end. So, um, yeah, listen, I'm with you. The Jaguars, I think I said a couple months ago, uh, you know, or weeks ago, they're already to me. A, I think a very much need to be in the discussion of a of a possible one seed in the AFC because of the weak division and the talent they have. Uh, now, their schedule is not easy by any means, but no one's schedule in the AFC is easy because the AFC is so brutal that every week you're going up against a top seven quarterback, it feels like, because of exactly. all the talent yeah. and on that side of the ball they have. So um, I think the Jaguars, uh, to me, this is a really solid move, and it shows the Jaguars, again, what did I say for years? Like when they lost Jalen Ramsey, and it's something that I've I've re reiterated over and over again for losing franchises that have uh, a bad history of winning recently: the Browns, the Lions, the Bears, the the or the Commanders, the Jaguars. One of the things that always happens is is you let guys go, and it's like you or a, a homegrown draft pick you then let go because they either don't mm -hmm. want to sign there or you have to way overpay. This is not overpaying. And keeping a guy you brought in who was productive, like this is a good cultural move. And so makes me happy for Jags fans and uh, excited for Trevor Lawrence that he gets to keep this weapon and someone he's built up some uh, confidence with. Yeah, there's continuity there all through that offense. That's huge. Absolutely. Well, I have been diligently uh, looking to the side here and refreshing my uh, Twitter feed. I know, uh, me too. Looking to see if we've got some news. We are now at T-minus one hour before this franchise tag deadline. As soon as we uh, stop come up with a new news. extension, it, it just doesn't look like it's going to happen. I'd be surprised if it literally went down to the 11th hour here, but crazier things have happened, certainly. But that brings us to our final topic here on the show, Mark, and that is the three remaining players with their franchise tags that have not yet signed an extension with their team. So Tony Pollard of the Dallas Cowboys is the only one that signed his franchise tag here. So yeah. he will play on the tag this upcoming season, but it has already been reported that the Cowboys are not 
uh, going to have an extension worked out with him. So that means they're going to have to wait until 2024 to potentially do a long-term deal with him. But that leaves us with the Giants, Saquon Barkley, and the Raiders, Josh Jacobs, who are threatening a holdout because they don't want to play on the franchise tag. They want a new deal, and now they have 58 minutes and counting uh, to get a deal done. Otherwise, we may potentially not see either of these guys playing in the 2023 NFL season, which would be big blows to both of their teams considering Josh Jacobs was the NFL's rushing leader last year on a bad team. Now a bad team that probably needs its rushing component more than ever with a quarterback turnover there, Derek Carr leaving. And in New York, where Saquon was as big of a part of Daniel Jones's improvement there as Brian Dable himself was. Yeah. So two very interesting storylines here. The Tony Pollard one, I think we're probably going to end up seeing a deal get done next year, but that's a conversation for 2024. I think Tony he Pollard. understands Pollard understands yeah, that he's coming off a major injury and playing in the franchise tag. He's got to prove that he's a bell cow guy. And and yeah. Pollard, Pollard never had a big contract. So for Pollard in the state of Texas, getting 10 point, whatever million just guaranteed dropped the bank count. That's something coming off an injury. You, you sign, you can't, you can't give that up because that is again, yeah. If, if you're never able to recover from the injury, you can make $10 million work for you for the rest of your life. If you invest it well, you know what I mean? Like he'll be, sure. he'll be fine. Um, in that regard. Um, I said it last week, Dan, I, I stand by it. Like I, I think Saquon is the only one who should even consider holding out. I think his holdout would mean more in New York, in that market, um, expose the giants and for, for what they have done with Daniel Jones. And expose the franchise, the the not the coach, but you know, the ownership group and the GM group for for doing that. It just, I think that one could really land. And Saquon being the number two overall pick, that's a lot more money than being the number twenty fourth overall pick, like like Josh Jacobs was. Yeah, yeah. And with his big national endorsement deals with Subway and other things, he's got probably the ammunition to hold out and and not to hurt his lifestyle and his goals. If I was Josh Jacobs, I would sign the tag. I'd take that 10 million in the state of Nevada. Again, I'd put it away. I'd go out there and I'd try to lead the league in rushing again, carry a bad franchise. And then I think his market is still really solid next year. If he does hit free agency or if they sign him to a long-term deal next year, fine, you stay there, whatever. Um, but I, I think that his market is safe. If he, his injury history is not nearly what Saquon's is. And I think um, his value is, is still very high next year uh, coming out of a, uh, coming out of a, a franchise tier gag where I think Saquon has more to prove as far as the holdout will expose. What I'm telling you is you need me to make this, your $40 million dude work. And uh, I think that will be shown pretty early on if he does hold out. Yeah, I, I I would agree with you there. I mean, it's um, it's it's looking like we're going to have a holdout, at least one. Uh, that that's just kind of what it feels like, yeah. right? I I I find it hard to believe that both of these players end up signing this franchise tag and uh, agreeing to play on it. I think of the two that's likely, I agree with you. Saquon's most likely to hold out and sit Be because also his skill set as well. Not that Josh Jacobs can't catch or anything like that, but Saquon is, is absolutely a well-rounded three down back. Josh Jacobs is a three down back, much more of a rusher than a receiver. Whereas I feel Saquon is pretty much 50, 50 on both. He can do a lot. I think that opens him up to fitting in more offenses in the league. And so Saquon, you hold out next year, you'll have a large array of teams that you can sign with. Whereas maybe oh. for Josh Jacobs, it would be slightly narrower. Uh, not that they're, they're both going to find a location. So, you know, that's, that's the state of the running back. That's what we talked about in our episode. And so there's no reason to kind of harp on that, but that is the situation we find ourselves in and why maybe we're seeing Tony Pollard signing the tag and saying, I'm going to make my money, guarantee it right now, uh, ball out and, and prove it. Whereas these other guys have said, we've proved it. 
We need to get paid now. It's our prime. Tony Pollard's still, I believe, what, 25 years old, 24 years old. Like he's a young guy still. Uh, whereas Saquon and uh, Josh Jacobs are what, maybe 26, 27, just getting up there a little bit more. So it's putting you in that position where you're probably a little bit more urgent uh, to make your money and, and get paid now rather than wait. But this is a, every year we find ourselves in these franchise tag situations and there's always, you know, one that's potentially going to hold out. We may actually see it this season where it ends up uh, actually happening. And maybe both do. That would be kind of unprecedented. I, I want to look back and see when two superstars at a skill position held out on the franchise tag. That would be interesting to see. So maybe that's something to look up for, for future reference. But um, yeah, I'm intrigued to see kind of how this plays out. And like I said, 50 minutes left. I don't think we're going to hear any news here. No, <laughs> just not going to happen. So, yeah. Anything else, uh, Mark, that you want to touch on with today's episode before we uh, kind of toss it uh, to next week and um, and look forward to some more news? No, it's, the NFL. It, I, it's yeah. yeah, we'll have we'll have more by next week. But I think it's crazy is that we are now at that point where starting next week, we're going to really just start focusing 100 percent on this upcoming season. And uh, it's an exciting place to be. Yeah, we've got obviously predictions that we we start running through. So we're going to have those for you guys uh, in just a few weeks from now. Start going through our, you know, uh, divisional breakdowns uh, for for each conference, seeing how we how we think they're going to play out. And uh, as always, every year we do that, we kind of release them in um, sections. And so we're going to do the same this year, ramping up, leading all the way to the start of the NFL season in that second week of September. So really looking forward to that. And now we're really getting into the meat and potatoes of the off season where training camps get underway. Hard knocks is going to be going in a couple weeks. The NFL top 100 didn't even reference that uh, oh, yet yeah. on the show this year, but that's going to be coming up here shortly as well. So a lot of these programming uh, items to keep us excited and ready for the upcoming NFL season. But uh, for now, that does it for us here on the Football Lounge with Mark and Dan. You can check out our work on YouTube, uh, as well as on social media, Instagram threads, Facebook and Twitter, and as always on ForFantasySakeQC.com of the For Frequency Sake Podcast Network. That'll do it for us here. This time on the Football Lounge, we'll see you here next week. Mm-hmm.